Hello and welcome to Notes from the Conservatory, a podcast from the Bob Cole Conservatory of Music at California State University, Long Beach. This podcast is a chronicle of conversations and interviews with our faculty, students, and guest artists. I'm your host, Richard Cooper. This is our second episode in our Stranded series where I ask our guests what three pieces of music they would take with them to a desert island. Today, my guest is Moni Semenov who is the head of strings here at the Bob Cole Conservatory. Moni is a native of Bulgaria who came to the United States on a full scholarship to the Idlewild Arts Academy in California. From there, he attended the Eastman School of Music where he won first prize in the school's concerto competition, then on to Yale for his master's degree. He's currently working on his PhD at USC's Thornton School of Music where he also teaches violin and chamber music. Moni also performs with the Los Angeles Chamber Orchestra, the LA Master Chorale, and serves as concert master for the Sacramento Philharmonic. And now, here is my interview with Moni Semyonov. Well, first of all, before we get to our desert island, I wanted to get a little bit of information about you. So tell me about your, your background, your musical history. So I started playing violin when I was about five years old. It was really clever on my mom's part to make me play the violin uh, she also made me think that it was my idea. She bought me a violin when I was four, and like anything else in our small apartment, I wanted to play with it, and she said, no, you can't play with it, so she put it behind a vase in the corner, standing up in its case, and every once in a while, she'd make me wash my hands, dry them thoroughly, and then she'd allow me to open the violin case and then plug the strings, and then I really, really wanted to play it, and she said, no, it's not time yet, it's not time yet, so when I turned five, she said, okay, now it's time. If you want to play, then go ahead. Of course, that was her plan all along. And uh, so for the first few years, every time I didn't want to practice, she just reminded me that I'm the one that wanted to play it. So that's how I started playing. Of course, I grew up in a family of musicians, which is very typical for Eastern Europe. We generally, things run in the family. So if you're a, a child of musicians, you're expected to know an instrument. And if you are not, then it's very difficult to find a teacher, know whom to study with, and you basically get a very late start, so you don't really have the chance to make this into a career. And like most places in Eastern Europe, you don't just do something for fun, you do it because you're expected to make a living in it, which is kind of terrible because, you know, even here in Orange County, I believe there are more violinists than in the entire country of Bulgaria, which is where I come from which also means that the only people who go to concerts in Bulgaria are the musicians, because no one else has been exposed to music, the study of music, or the beauty of classical music. In your basic education, there's no introduction to classical music, like if you're just in elementary or high school? If you're in elementary school, perhaps you'll have singing thing, it's not even a class, where you sing children's songs maybe once a week on a Friday and most people opt out of that so that they can go and play soccer outside. So that that's about the exposure that people get to classical music otherwise. What about your uh, formal education in Bulgaria? So I started playing violin at five and at six I started going to school and that school was of course the music school. It was the school where everyone who was playing violin at five would go and study. We had theory classes, solfege, or oral skills, as they would call it here, and then, of course, violin lesson, chamber music, and orchestra didn't come until much later, because another misconception in Eastern Europe is that if you play orchestra and chamber music, you're going to take away from your skill at the solo performance. It's almost like a soccer player thinking they're going to get bad at soccer if they do laps in the swimming pool you know it's you know you can convince the teachers otherwise so i played and i had whatever successes i could have had in bulgaria i played on the radio on tv i played with orchestras and then by the time i was 14 all kinds of things had already happened politically in our part of the world so a lot of orchestras went under and a lot of great musicians started leaving the country like my uncle went to become the concertmaster of the orchestra in Las Palmas on the Canary Islands in Spain. And he moved his wife there as well, who is also a wonderful pianist. She works there as a teacher now. So there was a big dilemma. Should I continue playing the violin or should I do something real with my life? So we said, maybe I'll send the tape to this high school that a bunch of other Bulgarians had uh, also attended. And perhaps 
if something wonderful happens, then I'll go to that school. If not, then I'll think about you know applying for real colleges in the future. So I sent the tape, and then the violin professor heard it. Um, this was at uh, the Idlewild Arts Academy, which is in California. It's a wonderful school. Still is a wonderful school. It has changed a lot in the last few years, but it still is a great place to study music and the arts. So I got offered the full scholarship. At the time, it was something around $40,000 a year, and that was 20 years ago, so that was a lot of money. Right now, it's about $70,000 a year. So I, I did my last three years of high school there. Of course, I learned English there. I got my first exposure to real chamber music and, you know, sitting concert master in an orchestra. It was also my second time playing orchestra, so I was pretty new at it, you know. And because I was playing all these difficult violin pieces, I don't know how I was playing them, but I was playing them, and yet I had no exposure to sight reading or playing in an ensemble. Yeah. I was off memory? The orchestra? No, no, you're all, playing. Everything else was by memory, yeah. And I, I used to wear thick glasses and I used to not wear them, so I memorized things quickly. So, so after Idlewild, I went on to the Eastman School of Music in Rochester because I had met the violin teacher at Eastman. I had met him at the Music Academy of the West, which is in Santa Barbara, a wonderful summer festival. And the teacher, he did the American premieres of the Stravinsky and the Schomburg concertos. The Stravinsky with Stravinsky conducting. Yeah, he recently died at the age of 94, but he was a great history of the violin tradition in this country, at least. And he had studied with a student of Vieniavskis and Viotans, which is composers that we play all the time as violinists. So I felt like my connection to, to those composers and other performers of the time is not so distant when you know that a person with whom you take lessons every week studied with a person who also took lessons every week from those people. So after studying at the Eastman School of Music, uh, I went on to receive my master's at Yale University, and then I stayed there for my artist diploma as well. Then during my artist diploma year at Yale, I met Midori in New York, and then she took me as a part of her first class at University of Southern California. She's actually leaving uh, USC this year. She's moving to Curtis next year, so it's a full circle. Mm -hmm. um, I was one of the first students that she was teaching here, and now all of us are gone doing something else, and she's finishing her last student this semester and then moving on to, to Philadelphia next year. So after finishing my graduate certificate, or as we used to call it, the gift certificate at USC, because it's such a meaningless degree. It was very meaningful for me because I got to take lessons and not do anything but violin for about two years. And then I decided to do my doctorate there. I've finished everything for my doctorate, including qualification exams in five of my recitals. And I have one more recital left to do, and that's going to happen next semester. And then I'll have a doctorate. But in 2014, I had just finished my classes for my doctorate. I applied for the job here, and I was very surprised when I kept making it to each following round of the interview process. And of course, the last round being the most gratifying, whether one gets the job or not, because you get to meet the students, you get to hear them play, you play for them, uh, you get an actual interview with the committee, and then... I had to sit down with some of the students as well, and that was very interesting. Uh, so very lucky for me, I was offered the position, so I accepted it right away. That was in 2014. I think it was in April of 2014, so I started uh, just a few months later. If you had to do something else, like back when you were in high school, if you didn't get accepted, what were you thinking of? Any other alternative career paths? Uh, the first thing that really interested me, th in Bulgaria we have this thing called the American College, and it's particularly difficult to get in. You have to have really high scores of the standardized Bulgarian tests. Uh, and they're not easy because you know, it's a rigorous educational system, or at least it used to be when I was a kid, and maybe it's deteriorated some since. But afterwards, when I went to Yale University, I was invited to join the Bulgarian community at Yale. And there were about 70 Bulgarian students at Yale. And, you know, Bulgaria as, as population is about half the size of Los Angeles. So it was very surprising to me. And about 65 of those people at Yale had gone to that one college, the American college in Bulgaria. So I was going to apply for that college and have that be my first choice. In terms of career, I've always been interested in law. 
and uh, athletics. So I would have done something that had to do with one or the other. In fact, I uh, took the LSAT while I was at Yale. Uh, it was as a part of a bet that I had with friends, and I scored pretty well. But I'm now glad that I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> <laughs> so you've lived in Southern California for quite a while now. Yeah, I moved in 2007. Well, tell me about your studio here at BCCM, your students and what you do, your program. So about my studio, it's really, really small. We can fit, we can barely fit three people in there. But my students are wonderful. And because of that, I can share it with all of them. Uh, right now I have 10 students. And of course, I feel like I'm taking care of everyone else about the 60 string players that we have here. We have 60? About 60, yeah. I have a few undergrads and a few grads. Actually, three of the grads are leaving this year, and I really miss them because two of them finished their undergraduate degree with me. Their last year, when they were seniors, that was my first year of teaching, and then they decided to stay here for master's. So I'm excited to get new students next year as well. And what we do in lessons is um, I like to divide it into technique sessions and then normal lessons. And in the technique sessions, I try to talk about nothing else but technique because it starts to get watered down a little bit if I have them thinking of too many things at the same time. And I really do believe in thinking of one thing at a time until that thing is clear, well understood, or at least at level. And we also have studio class every Friday. In studio class, we have a few different activities going. It's not just a normal studio class where the students perform and then we all give comments and then we move on to the next person. Of course, that's a big part of it, but we also have a technique challenge. And if someone is practicing technical exercise, and I hope that all of them are, and someone, let's say, is practicing a page of a finger exercise by Shradek, which is the standard for violin, then that person, after successfully performing it in studio class, and we almost never perform these kinds of things, but you know, in my studio classes they do. Once they perform it successfully, they can nominate a couple other people to do it as well. And so then these people, after they perform it, then they can nominate two people each, and so before you know it, everyone plays it. Of course, the semesters get busy, and not everyone has time to prepare it to performance level, but Technique Challenge is one of those activities that we have. Another activity is a listening quiz. I started doing that last year, and I feel like it's uh, very important, not only for the students to uh, get to know pieces, but also by listening to these pieces, they're getting to know the names and the performance styles of famous violinists, or not so famous violinists that people should nevertheless know. And so the way it works is that each week a different person makes the playlist on Spotify. Then by the end of the day, on Friday, they send it to everyone and then people study for that listening quiz and then the person who created the quiz administers it. So it's a drop the needle thing, not many pieces, but usually standard pieces. And there's usually a unifying theme. So for example, scherzos from string quartets or violin show pieces or slow movements of concertos. So they find the theme and then they search within that theme. So those things are not forced by any means. So I make them play the technique challenges, but the presentation is something that students like to do on their mm -hmm. own. I just encourage it. So someone reads an interesting book and decides to do a presentation. They can just talk about it or they could make a PowerPoint. Like my student Jacqueline just a few weeks ago decided to present on the inner game of tennis. And she did a wonderful PowerPoint. And yeah, I remember reading that book when I was her age. And I remember how influential it was in my life. Another one of my students, Laura, she read the book by Carol Dweck called Mindset, about the fixed and growth mindsets. And that's a wonderful research from Stanford University. And she did a great presentation on that too. It can also be on a chapter from a violin book about shifting or about extended techniques. Or someone can present on a famous violinist or on a violinist that people don't know but that particular person enjoys listening to. So maybe they can introduce us to that violinist through that activity. And we have a few more. We have seven activities altogether. Everyone has to complete each activity twice. And then if they all do, then we all go on a studio outing. So far, we've been able to go on studio outings. We go to Knott's Berry Farm. And then after that, after we're done with roller coasters for the day, I take them to Korean barbecue. And that's also a lot of fun. It's a very different activity. I like the order in which we do those. Mm -hmm. Could be different, but I think 
bit roller coasters before <laughs> overeating is best. And I imagine those activities breed a lot of connection between the students. Yeah, and I think what usually happens is that the students team up against me, mm. which I'm perfectly fine with. I'm okay being the villain as long as they get along, as long as they help each other with comments. Um, if you have any uh, musical heroes. I think my late teacher, Mr. Zeitlin, Zvi Zeitlin, uh, maybe not a personal hero, but a musical hero. I remember up until the very end, he would practice etudes and scales every morning. He knew all the etudes books and he, he could play you any number. You just call out a name of a composer for etudes and the number and he would play it starting up bow, starting down bow, because he was so familiar with these things. And I think that tradition is somewhat getting lost today. We're getting so pragmatic, so practical. We want to impress, we want to make ends meet in a way. And we're trying to take a shortcut by not doing the fundamentals very often. And I feel like no one is too good for the basics. No one. I do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and Judo and Every time that I see my judo instructor who is close to me in age, but he's been in four different Olympic games already, every coaching starts with him doing the most basic exercise. It's a foot sweep in judo, we call it. It's something with which you sweep the feet of the opponent so that they fall. It's not a, a major throw, but it's something that you can nevertheless use all the time if you time it correctly. And it's something that I'm sure that he has done these things successfully in competition, perhaps thousands of times and yet he practices that's the first thing that he practices and after each coaching is done he does 700 push-ups <laughs> and that's probably not even his first set for the day <laughs> so no one is too good for the basic and he doesn't do the push-ups because he needs to expand his chest he does the push-ups because each push-up is a practice of pushing the opponent away from you and I notice this in all great athletes and also people who write for a living. They have to turn certain things into systems. So they don't skip the beginning. They don't skip the so-called warm-up, as we would call it in music. And in a way, to use the martial arts analogy again, they put the white belt on every day. When we pick up our instruments every morning, we should get to know the geography of the fingerboard as if it's the first time we're seeing it, rather than, oh, I was good last night, I should probably start where I left off last night. It's like uh, John Cage's beginner's mind. Uh-huh, yeah, yeah of wonderful. course. Well, let's look at the pieces that you've chosen. Uh, the first one was Claire de Lune by uh -huh. WC. So tell yeah. us why that one. Uh, I think all of these pieces that I've chosen are so cheesy, but I think that's just, it's, it's me, I'm cheesy like that too. But the Clair de Lune, there is a particular reason why I like it. Mm, when I was little, I had read all the children books that we had in my house. And all the adult books, there are so many. The entire wall was just books and bookshelves. A lot of books that my parents and grandparents saw that I wouldn't understand yet. And I can imagine because that those were, you know, Victor Hugo and Anna Karenina there as well. So perhaps topics that I wouldn't have been able to appreciate. So what kept me busy is listening to fairy tales on tape. And of course, those are for little kids. And the one that uh, I liked listening to the most was The Wizard of Oz. And for some reason, Claire de Lune was the theme music for that. So every time they went on the yellow brick road, that was the, the music that we would hear. And finally, you would hear the entire piece. This was an orchestra version of it, by the way, not the piano version. but. At the very end, when you realize who the wizard is, and then you would hear the complete piece. Otherwise, it was just snippets from here and there. And I thought, like, like any little kid would have, I guess, at the time, I thought that this was music especially composed for that particular book on tape. When I remember hearing it in a piano recital, I was like, someone's playing the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> and of course, my mom was like, no, that's clear. The one is. And my mom's, my mom's a pianist. So. So it just, it brings me back to my childhood. I think it's beautiful music, but I don't think it would have been as meaningful if I hadn't heard it before I came to maturity.
That was Claude Debussy's Claire de Lune by the London Symphony Orchestra, conducted by Stanley Black. There is a story with this one too, I guess. It's, it's from Cavalleria Rusticana. It's a short opera by Mascani, Pietro Mascani. Usually that opera is performed alongside another opera called Pagliacci. The two of them have similar plots and same time period as well. Pagliacci is usually performed second and Cavalleria is performed first. And since it's a one act thing, then the intermission comes between the two operas. And they're not operettas by any means, they're serious operas, but because they're so short, they get performed together. So both operas end up with a lot of slaughter, like a lot of people get killed and it's mostly because of love. And Cavalleria Rusticana meaning the rustic honor or the rustic chivalry. It's almost like the quiet before the storm that this intermezzo shows up in. The village square is empty. Everyone who has been talking and singing and fighting there has now gone into the church. This is almost like an intermission between acts. And during that break is when the orchestra plays, instead of an intermission, it's an intermezzo. And it sounds so major and so happy and in a way carefree if you don't know what else is about to take place that it puts you at such ease that later on when the killing starts I mean of course anyone who goes to see that opera probably knows what's about to happen my famous performance of it is anyone can see it on YouTube it's a pretty old recording of Riccardo Muti the conductor of La Scala, conducting the orchestra in La Scala. This is during the actual opera, so the cameras are in the pit. And you can see he's drenched in sweat, and he's shaking with intensity when the climax comes. And the performers are absolutely responding to it. He might not have been very well liked in that opera house, but he made a big, big difference uh, in how they sounded. And it's used in some popular films actually two that you may know is the raging bull they mm -hmm. think it's black and white yeah? yeah a lot of innovations in that movie but he uses that as the opening theme oh. and another movie where it's used and i think it's used while a lot of killing is taking place actually where in the last of the godfathers there is no source sound if i remember correctly there is no source sound so the slow motion tommy guns shooting people are not making any sound you just hear this wonderful descending major chord of the intermezzo and when i was little my grandma who is also a pianist she was the accompanist for the opera where i grew up and so very often she would take me with her because, you know, no babysitters. I don't think, I don't think that even now there are babysitters in Bulgaria. I think the grandmas do that job because everyone lives in the same house anyway. So she would take me with her to the night rehearsals and then I would often fall asleep underneath the grand piano. So I remember hearing this intermezzo over and over played in, by the orchestra while she was waiting to coach the singers afterwards.
was the intermezzo by Pietro Mascani, performed by the Chicago Symphony Orchestra, conducted by Ricardo Multi. All right, and then the third one was the Rachmaninoff Second Piano Concerto, the uh, second movement. Yeah. Why that one? That one is just so beautiful. If I had to pick one of these three to take with me, it will probably be that. Rachmaninoff's harmonic language. Everything is so simple, and in, in a way, when you know Rachmaninoff's music, so predictable. I don't think that he was that great of a composer technically, but he gets to people's hearts so wonderfully. And there's a lot of repetition, obviously, just like with a lot of Russian composers from that time period. But I think that they went straight for emotion rather than the logic of why one chord should follow the other. Perhaps this is, to me at least, the most quintessentially Rachmaninoff piece of all his pieces. Where did you first hear that one, do you remember? Yeah, actually, I do remember. It was when I first came to the States, one of the older students in my dorm told me to join something called Columbia House, which (laughs) used to exist, but I think most people listening to this won't know what Columbia House is. And it's a service that sends you CDs if you order them from a catalog. Of course, there was somewhat of an internet then, but you couldn't just download music on the internet. Torrents were not a thing yet. So the reason why he wanted me to join is that by joining for a very small fee, you would get 15 CDs free. So he wanted me to join because he would get something free for getting me to join. So I think he, he targeted all the, the little freshmen, right? But anyway, so I, one of the CDs that I ordered was Gary Grafman. I have the feeling it was Philadelphia Orchestra with Ormandy, but I'm not sure. And I remember hearing that then. and. Up to that point, I had only been listening to audio tapes, so I hadn't been listening to CDs. But I also grew up in Bulgaria where it was perfectly normal to watch black and white TV while people here were playing Nintendo. So to me, the shock of that crystal clear CD sound was so tremendous, I couldn't ignore it. And when I listened to the first set of CDs, I remember listening to that particular movement thinking, how can the piano sound so beautiful? Of course, it had been mastered and remastered, and I knew nothing of that at the time, but it sounded like nothing else I had heard before. And it happened to be that concerto, which is also beautiful. So I listen to it with special ears every time I hear it or play it.
that was an excerpt from Rachmaninoff's Piano Concerto No. 2, Second Movement, performed by the Nordwest Deutsch Philharmonic with Anna Fedrova on piano. On this desert island, if you had a chance to take a book with you... Hmm, I'll say maybe Le Miserable. Partially because it's a very long book, <laughs> and I'll have time to read it and understand all the themes. I think with a lot of this literature, kind of like with great pieces of music, once you do the first reading, you get to know the surface of the story and who does what to whom and so on. Then the second time you start to realize a little bit of the intricacies of what the author may have meant by hidden themes. And then after that you start to see, on the third reading, you start to see even more of the background that you were completely blind to before because the story was so overwhelming. So I think a book like that would serve well with multiple readings. And the last thing I'm going to ask is what's coming up for you? Well, very near future plans. Next week I'm going to Bulgaria. I'll be playing a concert. I'm actually sharing the program and then playing a duo piece with the new concert master of the Vienna Philharmonic, who is a Bulgarian lady. It's very unlike that orchestra to hire a non-Viennese, a non-Austrian, and a non-male. So, yeah, she, she's done wonderful things, and I'm looking forward to going and playing with her. Uh, I'll be playing two pieces in the first half. She'll be playing two pieces as well, and then the orchestra is going to accompany us for... Uh, the thing that we play together and after that you know summer is summer I'll be teaching in various places but something that I've started to do since last summer is I've started to write exercises for the top 10 violin audition excerpts for orchestras so these are etude like exercises that help with structuring the passages so rather than just practicing them from slow to fast I try to examine auxiliary notes in shifts the implied double stops and string crossings and various other methods of getting a person to create a scaffolding around a technical passage so when the scaffolding comes off then the technical passage is much better even if you've never actually practiced the passage directly so I already finished making the exercises. My students have been very helpful in proofreading and practicing and telling me what works, what doesn't, where there is a typo, and so on. So what I've done is I have the first page of each PDF is the excerpt itself. And when you click on the passage in question, you get transported to the page of the exercises for that page. And I already got a domain name. And I have a lot of writings about violin and music and a lot of them they target the intersection between sports and violin or martial arts and violin so I think that's kind of a unique angle I know that I'm interested in it and I don't know how many other people are but I'll just put them up in case anyone's interested and all these things will be free for people to download so I hope that by the end of the summer I'll have that. All right. Well, I'd like to thank you very much for letting me uh, cast you away on a desert island. Oh, it's I appreciate it. my pleasure. This has been Notes from the Conservatory from the Bob Cole Conservatory of Music at California State University, Long Beach. Thanks for listening.